to Matthew Dickerson. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hopefully you've all had a wonderful day out here. It looks a lot warmer inside than it does outside, so you've picked a good spot to be in terms of your location, and it sounds like from a bit of feedback I've had from people already, it sounds like it's been a, a fantastic day. So I'm going to focus today on not just Dubbo, but really talking about cities the size of Dubbo across New South Wales and across Australia. So I'm going to be focused on some of the larger cities and, and my opinion on how we might grow some of those cities and what are the, the things, the key triggers for those. Before I start that though, what I want to do is look at a what I would call a, a locational density map. And if you can see that map there, that gives you a snapshot of what New South Wales, and, and that map is generally reflected across the nation, but it, it gets too small when you go across the entire nation. But generally what the state of New South Wales looked like from a population density perspective, obviously each larger dot represents a higher population. And we've taken Sydney out of that because Sydney would obviously envelope such a large area. But you get a bit of a look at that and you can see some of the, the large population centres. You look at Broken Hill, major population centre there. You look at places like Newcastle, fairly large, but look at Wollongong. There's next to nothing there at Wollongong. Canberra obviously didn't exist. There was a, a little line on a map, but it didn't really exist. And you've got a few spots throughout the rest of the state, Inverell, Moree, Canamble, Cobar. You can just see Dubbo there. Uh, Bathurst is, is a little bit larger down there. Uh, I think Goulburn and I think even Nowra, just to keep Paul Green happy. I think Paul's in the audience somewhere there, but Nowra is featured on that map as well. So West Wyalong, yeah, West Wyalong as well. So you've got a, a few areas, but you can also see lots of tiny dots scattered across the entire state. Let's jump forward about 100 years and have a look at the population density. What you see there now is a dramatic change in where people are. And I'll just go back a couple of times or forward a couple of times to give you an idea there. You can see those smaller red dots have basically disappeared. In that 100 year time frame, many of those small dots disappeared. And then you see these red dots get incredibly large in certain spots. Canberra now exists 100 years later, obviously, it's very large. Newcastle, Wollongong, look at the size of Wollongong, almost the size of Newcastle there. And up the coast, Port Macquarie, Coffs Harbour, Lismore. And you see some of those ones that were major before. Look at Broken Hill. It's gone from that size down to that size. So a dramatic change in terms of the population. And let's have a look now at a couple of the reasons that might have occurred. In the year 1901, the first vehicle manufacturer started in Australia. And in 1909, it was called the Tarrant Motor Company. In 1909, they signed up a distributorship with Ford Motor Company. It just happened to be the same year that Henry Ford started the Model T Ford. So 1909, motor vehicles very slowly started to come into this nation. And also on the 2nd of November 1922 was the very first commercial flight by Qantas, who was effectively the first commercial airline. And then you look at that graph and you start to see the change in what people could start to do once they had some freedom in terms of their transport. You've got almost 17 million cars on the road or vehicles on the road now in Australia. And you've got almost 60 million domestic flights are taken across this nation in any given year or that's growing every year. So suddenly from 1911 through to 2011, and the reason I had 2011 was the last census that map was drawn from, you had a dramatic change in the freedom of where people could move and operate from. So typically, if we go forward now to see why people made those decisions, typically back in 1911, you made the decision where to live based on where you worked. So if you worked on a farm, you lived pretty much at that farm because your mode of transport was either your feet or a horse maybe. So you didn't have really efficient means of transport. And you also made those decisions around, say, Broken Hill was around mining, obviously, Cobar around mining, but many of those small dots on that map from 1911 were all focused around where you lived because that's where your work was. So you live where you work, um, you, you chose not really so much where you live, but you had to get a, a job somewhere. And the other part was, if you were alive in 1911, your life expectancy, if you were getting um, you know, maybe towards your 50s, you probably didn't have long left. Uh, early 50s was a life expectancy of people that were born around the turn of last century. So the reason that Joe Hockey's having some heart attacks now about people getting into retirement and using their pensions up is because we live a lot longer now. So your, your life expectancy was early 50s and if you were older, and, and we're talking early 50s, you lived at home and then you probably stayed there where you lived and, and your children looked after you for the, for the six or 12 months and then off you went. 
Now, obviously, people have got a different scenario in terms of where they, they live and work and in terms of that life expectancy. Um, so there's a, a few changes now. The, the overall, or I suppose, overriding decision about where people work is really based around um, personal and family wellbeing. So in other words, how am I going to be comfortable? Where am I going to be comfortable? Where am I going to have the services that I need? Where am I going to have hospital services? I, I'm now expected to live into my 80s, not into my 50s, but maybe some of those years I'm, I'm being kept alive, I, I need some health services. It's parts of me wearing out. Um, there's knee joints that need replacing, hip joints that need replacing, a whole range of medical options that I need to take advantage of. Um, education is important. I want to make sure that I've got all the social services around me that I need. So really all of these things start to become very important. And the place of residence now, I don't think it's totally gone there, but the place of residence and our place of work are largely uncoupled, not completely uncoupled, but, but they're largely uncoupled to the point that you might work in the centre of Sydney, but you live in Parramatta. And to drive an hour, well, I think it's dramatic, but for somebody in Sydney, driving an hour probably isn't that big a decision, isn't that dramatic a decision to make. So they're, they're not living exactly where they work, which was the case many years ago. So the increasing importance of amenity is really the message that I would, I would drive home from these first couple of slides the importance of amenity, the importance of having the services and the, the social and infrastructure services that people expect and need where they live. So it's no longer about just create a job somewhere, build a mine somewhere. We see FIFO all the time and everyone talks about how bad FIFO is, but it's because people don't need to live where they work. People can choose to live on the Gold Coast and work in a mine somewhere in Whoopal. We've actually got a, a, an interesting scenario in Dubbo where we have what I call faux fee. We have a number of people who work in mines or in other jobs elsewhere and they live in Dubbo. So they fly out, fly in, rather than fly in, fly out, if you understand the subtle difference there. And we've got an A380 pilot that lives in Dubbo. As far as he's concerned, it's a one hour commute for him to get to work at Sydney Airport because he jumps on one of the Qantas planes and flies to Sydney and there he is at work. He's got friends that, that fly A380s with him that live on the north shore of Sydney and they take an hour and a half to get to work. So he thinks it's easier for him to get to work from Dubbo than it is for some of his friends who happen to live in Sydney. So you've got examples like that where people are choosing to live in an area and then work somewhere completely different. So that importance of an amenity and being able to do anything, anytime, anywhere, it sounds like an old slogan from the goodies, but that's the, the idea. And again, I don't think we're quite there yet as MBN connectivity becomes or goes along further throughout Australia and as people change their mindset, I think you'll start to see more and more of that uncoupling of where you live and where you work. And that's really important for regional Australia. You've seen the change from 1911 to 2011 in the population going towards the coast and towards metropolitan areas. But I think there's an opportunity there for us to start to turn that around. So let's look just very briefly with just, and I won't bore you with this, but I'll just run through them quickly to give you an idea of the snapshot of our population as it stands at the moment. 23 and a half million people. We've got 7.7 .7 million square kilometres. So three people per square kilometre. But where do we all choose to live? Well, our state capitals. Two thirds of our population live in eight state capitals. And I'm, I'm calling them state capitals even though the Northern Territory and Australian Capital Territory are territories. But effectively in our eight, in our eight capitals, we've got two thirds of our population living. And they're living at a population density of about three, sorry, 310 people per square kilometre. So we've got all this land around this nation, three people per square kilometre, yet two thirds of us are choosing, maybe not choosing, are in a situation where they're living at 310 people per square kilometre. And I mentioned before I want to talk about regional capitals, and, and this is a, a group that's been identified across the nation of 50 regional capitals. So one of the things that I think everyone can benefit from across all of regional areas is by some focus on some of the infrastructure in these regional capitals and then the flow on effect that we see. And as an example, in Dubbo, we see that when Dubbo's population grows, Narromine, Wellington, Gilgandra, the, the areas around Dubbo grow as well. Because for people moving from Sydney, for example, a, a 20 minute commute from Narromine through to Dubbo is nothing. It's a dream time. 30 minutes from Wellington, if, if you drive along the Mitchell Highway towards Sydney out of Dubbo at 8 o'clock, 8.30 on any given morning, the amount of traffic coming from Wellington through to Dubbo is quite incredible because people are sometimes living in Wellington and choosing to work in Dubbo. So it benefits the entire region when some of these capitals keep growing. So those 50 regional capitals represent about 4.1 million people. Now Sydney's about 4.8 million, Melbourne's about 4.4. So the regional capitals combined are a similar population to one of those major cities. And I think that's significant. And just to give you some examples there, you've got an idea of some of those 50 regional capitals that, that I talk about when I talk about regional capitals. There's, there's ones across the nation, but ones that you'd be vaguely familiar with. 
the population density for those regional capitals is 10 people per square kilometre. Not as nice as three, but a hell of a lot better than 310 people per square kilometre. <laughs> and one of the essential points that I'd make here is that these regional capitals typically have the same services as people in Sydney, the same options for things to do. And, and I jumped in a cab one day coming out of Sydney and, and I was going back to the airport and he said, oh, where are you flying to today? And I said, oh, back to, back to dreamland, you know, back to heaven. And he said, oh, you're going to the Gold Coast, are you? I said, no, 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 I'm going back to Dubbo. He said, oh, what would Dubbo have? And we ran through all the things that we had and the only thing he could get me on was the beach. And I did say we had Sandy Beach on our river, but I'm not sure how good the surfing is down there at Sandy Beach. So when he talked about art, when he talked about sport, when he talked about a range of different things that you can do in the city, we can do all of those at different levels and different ways in a regional capital. And that's the importance of these regional capitals. I did actually say to him when he said the beach and I, and I couldn't answer him on the beach, I said, when's the last time you've been to the beach? He said, oh, actually I live in Parramatta, I go to the beach once every two years. So the reality is that most people who live in Sydney probably don't take advantage of the beach anyway. So that's the, the sort of snapshot. The, there's some problems, some major problems with our state capitals. Traffic congestion, just think about over the last 20 years, you've had the population only go up by 21%, the car trips have gone up by 41% and the car ownership has gone up by 58%. So it's quite dramatic in terms of the amount that people are choosing to travel. Now some of that is not by choice. Some of that is because they're being squeezed out of the housing market and being pushed further and further out of the central part of Sydney. So, and, and that's not just Sydney there, that's state capitals, the eight state capital stats from the eight state capitals in general. But it gives you an idea of, of the sort of problems that I see that is occurring in some of those state capitals. The average commute time, now it's much worse, I say that to my friends in Sydney, that your you average commute is five hours a week, and they laugh at me, and they say if only it was five hours a week. But that's again, averaged across those eight state capitals. The average commute time for someone is five hours a week. 80% of people still drive their car. We're very addicted to our car in Australia, and maybe it's a reflection on the public transport system as well, but 80% of people drive their car to work, and it takes them on average five hours a week. I think if it takes me five minutes to get to work, I've had a, a slow day getting to work. Pollution increases. Now, some of these stats amaze me. We have a life expectancy of 72 days less for someone living in a capital city due to pollution only than someone who lives in a regional area. Now, 72 days doesn't sound like much, but I'd rather have the extra 270 days, thanks very much, rather not have the extra 72 days. And there were more people who died last year as a direct result of pollution in our capitals than died due to the road toll. So you start to look at these things that when, when someone in Sydney, you talk about some of these different advantages and disadvantages of regional versus city living, and, and they probably don't know these, but they feel like maybe sometimes they're, they're on that treadmill and they can't get off. And the cost of living, well, I haven't got any good data on cost of living except to say $800,000 they just tipped over, you would have all heard, the median house price in Sydney. And that's an incredible amount of money, I think, for a house. At the moment, we think Dubbo is going fantastically in our growth and the investment return people are getting, and we just hit the highest number ever, $318,000 is the median house price. And that median house is much better than the $800,000 house in Sydney. The $800,000 house is, a, is basically a toilet and one bedroom, I think. And Dubbo, 318 gets you three bedrooms, uh, brick veneer, or maybe an 800 square metre block. So again, you start to look at some of those problems with our state capitals and start to think that there, and that's not taken in Sydney, that's taken in America. I was, I was in New York once doing a presentation, and that was a photo I took out the, with the window of a building I was at. And I haven't counted them, but I reckon there's about 20 lanes there. And it, it looks like a freeway, but I think it's probably more like a car park. When I looked at it, those cars were barely moving. And, and that's where we're headed. When we keep putting more and more people into capital cities, that's where we're headed. And I, I just don't think that's a great way to live, uh, unless you really enjoy being in your car. So let's have a quick look at growth across Australia. We grew by 384,900 uh, 364, people last year. Of those, 289,000 went into those eight state capitals. So almost all the growth we saw in the nation went straight into those eight state capitals. Across regional capitals, 60,000 people. So that's not too bad. Those 50 regional capitals grew around about 1,200 people each. Obviously, some more, some less, but on average, not a huge amount of growth. And the great thing is that all those regional capitals have got the ability to service much higher populations. And, and again, these are average numbers across those 50 regional capitals. You've got 31% more headroom for water and sewer. So in other words, across the board, across those 50 regional capitals, they could grow by 31% more before you needed to do any upgrades to your water and sewer. And I know in Dubbo, our population is 41,573. Our water and our sewer upgrade that's underway at the moment, but we will finish shortly, can handle a population of 55,000. So we would have to do no upgrades to our essential water and sewer infrastructure if we grew by another 13, 14,000 people. Uh, so that's significant. The amount of headroom for power 
Um, I know there are data centres in Sydney that run their backup power supplies 24 hours a day because they can't get enough power from the grid to power their data centres. So we've got about 20% headroom across those regional capitals for extra power growth before they've got to do any upgrades to any uh, substations. And then about 40% headroom zone for land development. And again, I, I reflect that we're much higher than that in number. We've got about 8,000 blocks zoned for land development. So we've got all the pieces in place in regional capital. I think local councils across the nation have done a great job in getting all the planning in place and having everything ready to go for that growth. And, and we're getting some of that growth, but really just not fast enough. We're not going backwards, we're not going forward fast enough. When you look at infrastructure growth, there has been an allocation and a statement made by the federal government that over the, till the year 2031, they expect to spend 3.5 billion a year in those eight state capitals alone on infrastructure growth. An incredible amount of money. And when you break that down, that's about $12,226 per person per year that is going to be allocated towards infrastructure growth. Uh, quite an incredible number, I thought. When you look at the National Stronger Regions Fund, and that's about the only money that's being put aside for infrastructure growth from the federal government, $200 million a year for the rest of Australia. Now, I know the population in state capitals is, is higher. I've just said they have two-thirds of the population, but you know, my simple maths there doesn't say two-thirds, one-thirds equals 3.5 billion and 200 million. Uh, it seems like a slightly out of, out of kilter growth rate there. And then if we look at that, that breaks it down to $2,635 per person per year across not just regional capitals, that's across all of regional Australia. So we can show quite easily, we can demonstrate that it's dramatically cheaper. Imagine if some of that 3.5 billion started to go to regional infrastructure, and it's the old question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Can we get the growth by having the infrastructure in place, or do we need to wait for the growth to happen for the infrastructure to occur? And I think a leadership government could actually make a choice and say, let's put the infrastructure in place before we actually get the growth, because that will lead to the growth. Build it and they will come. So regional capitals, I think, can be the solution to all of the announcements that we see, we all, I'm sure, in regional Australia shake our heads when we see the announcements from various levels of government about the incredible cost they're spending on a variety of pieces of infrastructure. And we all go, oh, that's incredible money. I wish they could spend that in regional Australia. And I think rather than continually spending money on state capitals to try and cater for this congestion, maybe look at possibly a solution of regional areas, regional cities, regional capitals, regional towns. So the, the problem is, I think it's like that cartoon there, that the federal government and, and governments in general seem to be of this mindset that we'll just keep on doing the same old thing because we know that the population grows in Sydney, we put another tunnel in, we'll put a northwest rail link, spend a few billion dollars on that and that'll solve congestion. But that problem continues to go, to go on and on and on and what'll happen with that is that you, you just get to the stage where you just cannot move in a city and some cities I've been in overseas, you really can't feel like you can move and you really, you, you have trouble breathing with the air that's there. So these sort of problems could be avoided by if we started to look at some different solutions, I think. So briefly, how would I grow regional capitals? What would be the things to do? Well, the first thing I'd say is create some environments to fill some industry gaps. So I picked three particular industry gaps. The first one, scientific and professional services. Across all regional capitals, 4.9% of the employment is in scientific and professional services. Across the state capitals, 7.4%. Now when you think of scientific and professional services, there is no good logical reason that they have to be in a state capital, except they already are. But having some incentives in place to move some of those industries to a regional capital, to regional locations, would start to change that employment dynamic. The second one I found was financial and insurance services. I mean, most people in finance and insurance sit in front of a computer and have a telephone. Do they really need to sit in an office in Sydney to do that? Could they sit in an office in Dubbo or Parks or Timbuktu? It doesn't matter. I think they could do exactly the same job and probably do it more effectively because they wouldn't have to have that time taken up by a commute each day. I mean, friends of mine in Sydney say they've got to leave home at 7 o'clock in the morning to get into work. They don't need to start till 9, but they only want to have a 40-minute commute instead of an hour and a half, and it'll be an hour and a half if they leave at 7.30. I mean, surely that time could be used more productively by sitting in front of a computer in a, in a regional centre. And the third one is information media and telecommunications. Again, not as big a discrepancy there, but certainly an area there that some of those people don't need to be in a state capital. Surely some of those people could be in a regional area and do exactly the same job, if not a better job. So some additional support, some areas that I see government could make some changes. MBN seems like it's bleedingly obvious to me that you would roll that out in regional areas first. And I know there are very few areas, and even Dubbo, where we thought we were getting FTTP, we're not sure if we're getting FTTP now. We're getting some form of MBM, but we're not exactly sure what. There's many regional capitals in the EVO cities capitals. Only two of the seven will have NBN in the first or in this current rollout. 
There's lots of places in Australia that could take full advantage of that, and they're not in the CBD of Sydney. They're in regional areas located across the nation. So surely the most obvious thing to do to help grow regional areas would be to have ambient connectivity. I know it seems obvious, but government doesn't seem to be listening to that one. Um, government policy change, we often talked about this, taxation zones. Even in the state government in New South Wales, just payroll tax. Just saying to an organisation, rather than paying your payroll tax, and, and employees that get up around maybe 10 or 12 employees, they're not huge businesses, start to hit the, the limit when they're paying payroll tax. Moving those people or saying to an organisation, if you move to a regional location, you don't have to pay payroll tax. Now, the state government might be concerned about what they'd miss out on, but the additional amount they would save in the lack of congestion in somewhere like Sydney, I think would be, for them, a payback would be dramatically better. So just some simple things like that, some taxation zones, some changes there. Um, government leaderships, we've seen state water come to Dubbo, fantastic initiative, that's been great for Dubbo. The silly part was they were based in Parramatta in Sydney, yet they managed in the vicinity of 80 dams in regional New South Wales, yet they were based in Sydney. They're now based in Dubbo, they're actually closer to the dams they manage, and they can still get the staff they need to work in that office. The other idea is a CATO, it's, a, it's an acronym that I made up because governments like sexy acronyms, Combined Agency Teleworker Office. The idea of having a combined office for a whole range of different agencies. So you get up and go into work in your government office, but you might have 20 different departments working in that same office. But it's a government building where a government department has the correct security in place, has the correct connectivity, but you've got 20 different departments working side by side. So you don't need to move an entire department. I guarantee if you said to a government employee in Sydney, you can have the same wage that you're earning in Sydney now, you can work in a government department in a regional area somewhere, and you can, you can move there, we'll pay your transport cost to move you out there, and do you want to move to somewhere regionally? I guarantee there would be a lot of people who would love to be out of Sydney. In fact, Evo City surveys show that about two thirds of people living in Sydney would like to get out of Sydney. They're just not quite sure how to do it. And I think we can help them be the solution. Um, and the ATO in Albury is another good example, having the Australian tax office in Albury. Again, all those people, they don't go out and do field visits very rarely, or they might do some audits, but they mainly sit in front of a computer all day. And the last one is transport linkages. I did an article recently about a tunnel under the Blue Mountains, and people often laugh about the tunnel under the Blue Mountains. The payback period for the Sydney Harbour Bridge by the toll, and the, obvious, the idea of the toll initially when the Sydney Harbour Bridge was built back in 1932, was that the toll would pay for the bridge. It took 56 years for the toll to pay for the bridge. I did a quick desktop analysis, and, and don't quote me to the nth degree, but a desktop analysis of the cost of a tunnel under the Blue Mountains and then how long it might take you to get your money back via a toll. The cost was about $2.8 to build a tunnel under the Blue Mountains turned 104 kilometres into about 70 kilometres, but 70 kilometres it was straight and 110 k's, compared to 30 different speed changes between 40 and 80 kilometres from Lithgow to Penrith. Um, the payback period on that via a reasonable price toll was 19 years. Now, a lot better than the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but what it would do to Lithgow, Bathurst, Orange, Dubbo, to this entire region would be dramatic. But again, that lack of investment in those sorts of things. So let me just finish off by giving you a, an interesting picture there. That's a picture that relies on our fusiform gyrus. Our fusiform gyrus is a part of our brain that expects to see one thing, and that should look blurry to you, unless you know a lot of people with four eyes and two mouths. The fusiform gyrus in our brain expects to see one thing, and when it doesn't see that thing, it looks blurry and looks a bit unusual. But if we kept looking at that picture long enough, it would stop being blurry, it would actually look quite normal. So if everyone suddenly had four eyes and two mouths, we'd all look like that's how it should be. The thing that is really interesting is at the moment, government and in general people assume that the population growth we will have will be in the capital cities because it's been happening that way. So we all assume that, and that looks like a normal picture. The challenge for us in regional Australia is to say, let's change the way people think. Let's lead the way and show a new picture where population growth is occurring in regional centres. And then the challenge for us is to make that the norm. So when population growth occurs in the state capitals, that looks like a blurry picture. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, that was an insightful piece on how to grow a regional city and uh, and all the ins and outs and stats, which is very informative. Um, Gary's going to go a different tact. He's going to show how to grow a small city. Like Samora is a city, isn't it? Well, yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, he said to me earlier that he's been in the job 20 years and he's got another 20 years ahead of him. So we, we wish him luck. I are believers in rural Australia, New South Wales and Australia. Um, I, firstly, uh, let me begin with an admission. Um, 
I guess we're all friends here. Uh, and I have to admit up front that I absolutely love small communities. Uh, I've, I've lived in small communities most of my life, and uh, so I might have just that ever so slight bias uh, in what I say uh, through the presentation. And can someone tell me how to work this mouse? Is there a... <laughs> Hasn't got any buttons on it. Hit there. Okay. Okay, so why do I love small communities? Uh, I love what they stand for. Did you get hit? <laughs> on the apple. On the apple. Uh, no. There we go, the other end. Okay, I love what they stand for. Uh, the friendliness. The sea of friendliness of the people, the sense of community uh, that you see in small communities, uh, the caring nature of the people, uh, the opportunity to become involved, I think, is uh, is very important. The security, or the feeling of security, uh, the perception of security that small communities give you, and the chance to experience a sense of belonging. Now, belonging to a community and being part of a community. Uh, and I'm talking about not just being a bit player, but the chance to actually make a change, to be part of that community. Now, I know this is not for everyone, but in my experience, a lot of people living in rural communities, uh, sorry, in urban communities, um, they have that disjoint between themselves and their community, and they relish the lifestyle in small communities. I should also say that involvement can and does occur in urban areas, peri-urban areas, regional centres, um, everywhere. But I think generally uh, it's pretty well agreed that uh, it's easier to become involved in a small community. I'm a strong believer in the role small communities play in the region, uh, that they're partners in regional development. <coughs> the same way that regional centres and capital cities have their role to play, as Matthew mentioned earlier. It's a fair statement that smaller communities need the regional centres, but equally, it strengthens the regional centres by having the smaller communities around. My other confession, I, uh, I'll come straight out with this one and you probably work this out. I'm not an expert in marketing in any way, shape or form. I actually come from accounting and financial management background, so the concept of the creativity required in marketing is a bit of an anathema, to be honest. Uh, but I do hope that my experience in Kamora may be of use uh, to you, uh, that we can in some way unlock the jigsaw of, um, <coughs> of marketing a small community. We're here in Dubbo today, uh, a major regional centre, and the lifeblood of communities in the Western Districts, um, certainly those communities north and west of here, uh, as Councillor Dickinson uh, alluded to. The strength of Dubbo comes from within, but also from outside. In other words, Dubbo is strengthened by many communities and services. Similarly, Dubbo is a vitally important part of the smaller communities that provides those high-end services that can't come from within. <coughs> this situation is repeated all over the state and Australia, um, Albury. Matthew mentioned a lot of them. Albury, as you go through, Wagga, uh, Goulburn, Bathurst, Orange, Dubbo, Hamworth, the list goes on, but they all share that same sense of reciprocity. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'd just indulge a little bit and just tell you a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in a community uh, that views Dubbo as its regional centre. I talk about the town of Burke, 370 kilometres <coughs> roughly from here, northwest of here. We were declining and uh, uh, population currently a pick over, I think, about 2,000 people. Burke's an isolated community, there's no doubt about that, uh, but it's one with a great heart uh, and a great soul. It's probably there I gain my appreciation of uh, living in a small community and the role of community, what it means to be to belong, to have that sense of belonging to a community. It was a great place to live and grow up. I did my uh, uh, local government, the normal local government thing, and I know there's a couple of uh, GMs and whoever in the audience. Um, you move around the state, you go from council to council, and you sort of work your way up through the ladder. I did that uh, until about in 1989, uh, I went to uh, Kamora as Corporate Services Director. 
Now this was going to be a, uh, uh, a six month placement with the career move. Uh, it wasn't going to stay there. But I fell in love with the place and uh, 26 years later I'm still there. Uh, 20 years as GM. Uh, actually the story I, while I'm there was uh, um, it was never meant to go anymore. I was actually working in Snowy Rivershire and uh, I just got married. And uh, I don't know if anyone's lived in Berrydale or been through Berrydale but it's very cold. And uh, it was going to be one of the shortest marriages in history if I didn't leave the place. So, so that's why I'm at Tamora, uh, and uh, it was a decision I've never regretted. So if I can indulge for a moment, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a background on Tamora. Um, I guess giving a, a presentation in the final uh, marketing a small community, <coughs> I'd be a bit remiss if I didn't uh, at least give you some background on where I live. So Tamora uh, is located in the well, depending, it's, it's about 5,000 people. It's located in the southwest Slate Riverina uh, region of, uh, of the state. And I say depending because government departments, depending on which government department says we're in different zones, and in fact, in the weather zone, uh, we're in central west. Uh, but uh, we generally say we're in the, the Riverina southwest Slate, so we're on the cusp of those two. We're surrounded by a number of uh, similar uh, type communities, size communities. People will take a couple of thousand. Uh, councils like old places like West Wild, and I know there's Jeff Stein here from Glanshire, uh, Junee, Tudamundry Young, Grenfell, Coolerman. Uh, our major uh, our major service centre, our dubber if you like, is Wagga Wagga. Uh, it's a community of about 50,000 people, uh, a local government area of 60,000 people, and it provides a high end service, <coughs> more of the educational services that health services, special health services, uh, shopping, entertainment and the like. At a community level, uh, however, uh, we, we bat okay, we go okay. Uh, we've got uh, you know, preschool, three primary schools, a couple of high schools, new pay, excellent medical facilities, good shopping, um, cinema, theatre, uh, excellent recreational facilities, sporting facilities, a bit of pool, indoor recreation centre. But additionally, please, shots of wine. But additionally, we have a number of uh, unique attractions, um, including the Bundawarra Centre, which is a hub for history, heritage, and, uh, and tourism, and the world-class Tamora Aviation Museum. Uh, this year, Tamora uh, will host the Biennial Warbirds, and I might need to put it in on this one. Uh, the Biennial Warbirds Down Under Air Show, which attracts up to 20,000 people in, in uh, uh, November or weekend. Uh, and I'd like to just give you a short video, it is very short, it's only a minute or so, uh, a presentation of that affair. sensational, it would have had you absolutely rid of it. But this is happening in November and uh, it's just an example of a small community uh, having uh, things that people don't really expect. Uh, I guess you could say that there's not really many towns in Australia that have their own air force, which we do have. Uh, we've got uh, the Aviation Museum has quite a lot of uh, antique warbirds. Um, if there are any aviation buffs here today, by the way, um, I do happen to have um, some Warbirds DVDs. There they are there. Um, there's about a dozen of those. So anyone who, uh, who wants to take that away, that's a 2013 Warbirds uh, thing. So the other one, uh, so just come and see us after the, the panel session. The other thing is that uh, Warbirds on the 21st of November, and I think I was talking to Peter Bailey earlier, and he mentioned that Armadale was having a fly in the weekend after. So. Get before. the caravans out, sorry? Weekend before. The weekend before. Oh, okay. I don't want you run out of money up there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> get the caravan out and make it an aviation week. Uh, look, I believe tomorrow is an easy sell, uh, but that's obviously a broken view. And I no doubt that you all think exactly the same about your, uh, uh, your communities. I 
once the sales pitch is finished, um, I'll um, I'll go on to why I believe, uh, or how do I believe is the secret, it's my view, uh, of marketing a small community. So 20th and 21st tickets available online, um, and it, it really is a, a quite a good uh, uh, weekend. It's two days of life. So what do I believe? Every community has its own strengths. It's that little attraction that makes people want to be there. Uh, it's the reason why they call that community home. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that there's something that keeps people in a community. Uh, but often it's a well-kept secret. The important thing is to play to the strengths. Don't try and be something that you're not. The consumer, in, in this case, tourists and uh, people who are uh, moving there, are very canny. They can smell a fake a mile away, uh, and honesty is expected. So find your niche, your uniqueness, your community's uniqueness, whether that be a major tourist attraction, uh, whether it be the location, uh, whether it be the people, the calibre of the people in the community. Uh, it could be the price of utilities, it could be the weather, uh, it could be an abundance of, of um, uh, employment opportunities, whatever. But for the unique natural flavor, uh, um, features of a community, or maybe the unique unnatural uh, features, but whatever. But the possibilities are, are endless. But any marketing campaign or initiative must be honest. And this follows on from the previous point. Tell people the truth. We're not marketing a brand of soft drink or toothpaste or whatever, rather a lifestyle. It's a place to visit and a place to live. In the case of a move, it's probably the most important decision, or one of the most important decisions those people will ever make. It's up there with marriage, life partnership, career choice, your footy team, those big decisions in life. Dragons, by the way, so George. Um, <laughs> Example, tomorrow, where the mountains meet the sea. It's a great slogan, it's a beautiful picture, but it's not honest. It's not honest. <laughs> it could be. But you need to be truthful. That's an extreme example, but you need to be. You need to be. Uh, bad reviews are very damaging. Uh, to the brand, it's better to be honest. Don't undersell, but definitely don't oversell. If you want to see examples of this, uh, have a look at the raft of accommodation and uh, attraction type uh, reviews that you get out on places like Feedability and What If and uh, TripAdvisor. There's, there's a swag of them. These, these uh, wiki type reviews, they review everything. And I don't know about you, but if I go anywhere to see something, if I stay somewhere, if I want to eat somewhere, I check the reviews before I go. So make sure that you, uh, you be honest. The comments on these sites can make or break a business, but they can also make or break a community. There is no greater advertisement for a community than a happy resident. Or even better, a new resident who, after they've looked at everything, they've decided to come to your community. In marketing terms, it's goal. Absolute goal. Be human. I'm a great believer in the power of people. Uh, Tamora has been a participant at the Country and Regional Living Expo, or CARL, uh, since its inception. Uh, sadly, I would have it may be the last year this year, and I think that is a great uh, shame, and I, I certainly hope it's not. We also participate in a number of uh, promotions in urban areas, shopping centre promotions, um, lifestyle expos. We do them mainly through our sister city uh, in Sydney, which is Greenwood City Council. Is generally low cost, but almost always have huge impacts. Now, if I could concentrate on Carl and other events just for a moment, what we do at Carl uh, and, and these events. The first thing we do is we always have a cross section, or we, we always use residents from our region uh, to be on the stand. We, need, we have volunteers who believe, they believe in what they're doing. If possible, we use personal accounts of success stories. Uh, people that have relocated. Uh, in other words, a good cross-section of people. And these people are really passionate advocates to the region. They like to form smoke, seriously. They get out there and they, they absolutely push your community. They're wonderful. We have the information available. We try to have real estate agents here. We have health professionals, teachers, representatives of major attractions, a whole heap of people. Or at least if we can't, we get people training so that the people that are there have the knowledge to give the answers that they want. People want answers, they don't want, I'll get back to you in the 
data and I'll, I'll get back to you. I want the answers at the time. And similarly, they want unadulterated, accurate information. We put a great deal of energy into these events, but uh, really the results have been excellent. We've had many new residents uh, uh, to the community as a result, and many of these uh, people that have come into the community, almost without exception, they're wonderful citizens. They, they get involved in volunteerism, they get involved in clubs, community organisations. Quite a few of them have business start -up. They weren't in business when they come there, but they've started up business since they've been there. We always hold a follow-up weekend or several uh, where we invite people down to the border. In our case, we use the local real estate agents. Uh, we invite them to sponsor the weekend so they pay for the whole thing. After all, they're the ones who are going to make the money out of it. In the first instance, they're the ones who sell the blocks so they can put the money up front. This has costs attached to council, but really in the scheme of things, it's quite minor. Um, and it's generally in you know, our staff assisting and all the rest of it. We find out their interests and introduce them to the right people in the community service, and that will fit for them. We do little things like get the local paper to come and do a story with their concurrence. Uh, we treat them special. We make them feel special as they are. And as always, truth and honesty and information is, is important. Uh, there have been times, many times, when people have come to the stands of, uh, in Sydney and said, you know, uh, we've, we've told them that you know, what you want is just not available anymore. I'm sorry, you need to go to uh, something similar. Uh, a major centre because we can't we can't provide that and sometimes that's a deal breaker uh, uh, you know, particularly if it's, a, if it's a disabled child or something who needs uh, very specific care uh, they can't they, they need that uh, large centre uh, help whereas in Tamora uh, we couldn't provide that sometimes though we find they work around it uh, they're quite happy to they're happy with the community when they don't remember at this stage it's better having this alignment of expectations at that level than when they get there because then we've got that problem of bad publicity. I should also note at this stage that there's a, there's a leap of faith in terms of the investment. At the visitation level, people tend to uh, take brochures and plan their visit in the short to medium term, one to two years, up to two years. Some do it straight away, but most up to two years. It's almost never an immediate decision. At a relocation level, the time frame is extended. We found very few people make decisions on a relocation in like under 12 months. Typically the time frame is two to five years. In the case of Carl, we found the same people would come to us two to three years in a row, each time making further commitments. You know, they, they come to us and they say, look, we've we'll, we'll put our business in the way. We're going to sell our house. You know, we, we're looking for work in the region. Uh, we've had a look at the schools. But each time, the list goes on until one day, the stars align and they make that decision. And the other major point often made look is the decision that rarely involves one person. When visiting, the attraction must be of interest to all members of the family, or at least some proxy activity in place. Uh, now, without wanting to be uh, sort of stereotyping things, as an example, uh, the Four Aviation Museum is primarily male dominated. Uh, there's 60 to 65 percent of their of their clientele are male which leaves 30 to 35 percent of people who, uh, or their other significant others, uh, with not a lot to do. Uh, so this was recognised by the community and uh, a raft of activities were put in place for them, uh, whether it be shopping, whatever the case is, they extended the shopping hours and all the rest of it. And I, I should add that that's a great way to, uh, uh, to spread the visit a dollar a little bit further too. At a relocation level, the issue is more focused. Uh, many of the relocators have come from Sydney where dual income families are not just a desirable, they're an essential. And this is really ingrained into the psyche. So the need for employment generally means two jobs. One, uh, when the, before the move is made. Uh, similarly, the needs of the family is paramount. Uh, sporting, cultural, education, spiritual and social needs must be considered and for a truly great outcome must be delivered. Uh, the final part of the jigsaw is to understand what you want. Um, this is the this is the uh, marketing equivalent, if you like, of know your audience. Uh, for example, as a community, you're seeking new businesses, you're seeking new residents, so you're seeking retirees, young people, skilled people, unskilled people, or all of the above. In the market you're targeting, do you have the infrastructure to deal with it? And it's the old the old square 
uh, pegging around half argument. For example, there's no point targeting elderly residents if the health services and accommodation uh, in the community are of poor standard. Similarly, there's no point in targeting skilled or semi skilled or professional people if there are no jobs for them. It's common sense, but it goes back to the nation playing the strength. There's also the stage to look at the in details of the aspirations of the community. If a certain direction is chosen and the infrastructure is not in place, this will obviously determine the future community infrastructure and development strategy. There are many examples of this type of uh, uh, thinking and planning. Just around us, there are several examples very close to Wagga and I've no doubt close to uh, all the regional centres where the decisions have been made by communities not to compete uh, with the regional centres. Rather, these towns have provided an attractive and viable accommodation alternative uh, for people working in the regional centres. And uh, Matthew mentioned it earlier about the, the people from Wellington coming uh, back to, uh, to, to Dubbo to work. This has been, uh, they've done this by providing excellent community facilities and a point of difference. The concept of understanding what you want might seem a really basic principle, uh, but it is essential. However, as with any plan or strategy, there needs to be a clear understanding of where the path will lead. You need to set targets, measure outcomes as you would with any business activity. You knew the accountant and you would come through at some stage. And, and you really do need uh, to do that. I haven't touched on a whole range of uh, operational marketing opportunities, such as regional tourism, bodies, advertising and so on, but quite friendly. Um, so, but I would like to show you one uh, a marketing initiative that we used several years ago at Carl. Uh, and that uh, involved, we, just, we did postcodes. Basically, very simple, but they really went down well. And again, it's a low cost of embracing the concept uh, of a point of difference. In this case, a little terrace in Sydney, big price, one and a half million dollars, big terrace for a little price, 310,000 more. People don't think about that. Right? It's a very simple marketing tool. Um, drive nine holes in Gamora, drive nine tunnels in Sydney. For, find yourself a mortgagee or find yourself a mortgage free. So, you know, these were these were just a very simple idea, but uh, they are something that, uh, that did work. So in summary, I guess I'd, I'd like to, the message I'd like to impart is embrace your uniqueness. Uh, that's what you've really got to look for and genuinely welcome new people. Thank you, Gary, and we'll get a chance to ask Gary some questions later. I'd like to welcome uh, John Walcom. He's the chairman of uh, Regional Development Australia, RANA, and when he gets up here, you cannot believe that he's had 36 years of business experience in retail, manufacturing, commercial, and residential property development. Welcome, John. Thanks, Sam. It's actually 38 years, Sam. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I guess in some ways speaking about economic and population challenges in regional and rural uh, Australia and particularly New South Wales, after hearing, I think, um, while all speakers today have been very important and been very knowledgeable, I think there's a common theme coming out between Roger Fletcher and his little discussion today um, Michael Toby and his discussion, uh, Matthew Dickerson and his little talk, um, as well as uh, from uh, Gary from Tamora. And I guess of those four speakers, there's certainly three common themes from three speakers, and I guess with what I'm about to speak about with that economic and population challenges, we're coming from three business people or three entrepreneurs that are involved in some way, shape or form at a local or state government level. So I guess we start to see the common theme and what I talk about and, and I guess in some ways I, I should have been on before all of them because they've addressed a lot of the challenges that we have. So what I speak about will be going over I guess some ground of what they've spoken about, but what I'll probably do is drill down just a little bit more. Having 10 years 
um, experience as Chair of Regional Development Australia out here in the Arana region, speaking with other Chairs of other RDAs right across New South Wales and Australia nationally, is that those challenges aren't a lot different. But there is one message that I would like to give to each and every community is those challenges need to be addressed internally and it's not a one-size-fits-all remedy. And the reason I say that, while I'm going to talk about the economics, there are other problems that are underlying in those communities that are causing those challenges that those communities face. Some of those are good challenges, some of them are challenges where some would say are really elephants in the community and the community don't really want to address. I spoke at a Rotary dinner here some months ago to a community very close to Dubbo and they wanted to talk about regional development and what RDA does and we got talking and I said to them in my parting words, to fix the problems in your community is not up to federal government, it's not up to state government, and it's certainly not up to local government. You can all turn up at the local government meeting and you can all blame and point the finger at your council representatives or to the council staff. But at the end of the day, the only way that it will be fixed is if you come together as one, as a community, and approach your council and speak to them, you have a good chance of starting to resolve and fix those problems that exist in your community. And I guess that doesn't matter what happens in any community, whether it's economic or population or whether it's social. We need to keep it simple and we need to make it achievable. Roger Fletcher said today when he first started out in business, there was no great wish list or pie in the sky. He knew he had to keep it achievable. If he could only afford an old rusted out car to get about in, that's what he had to do. And if you could talk to most entrepreneurs and most of them start from very, very humble beginnings, as I did, and I know Matthew did, and I would suggest that the Costa Group did, and Michael could attest to some of those, you have to keep it simple. So that those challenges you, that you face are the challenges of just growing the economy within your community or the population. And there's ways we can do that, but it's about how we manage that. We need, as I said, bring the community together and we need to bring business within that discussion in community, but we need to treat that separately than just by addressing them all as one. Because if you start to go and talk to business and you want to bring business into a, into a group and start to say to them, how do we fix these economic problems? One, you probably won't get a lot turn up, and number two is you probably won't get an answer, or you certainly won't get an answer. Because entrepreneurs won't come together as one and start to answer those questions because they don't want to give the secret away. They like to work in confidence. So once you gain the confidence and you start talking to them one on one, you will start to work out how those economic, or what economic solutions they can help that will offer to fix the problems within the community. So it's very, very important to understand that. I know I won't, I'll go and I'll sit and I'll listen, I might throw a couple of ideas up, but I'm not going to fix the problem in front of the group. But I will be able to add some suggestions on how you fix those problems one-on-one -on -one and do it in confidence. It's really, really important. The other thing, and I think Roger mentioned it this morning too, is position, position, position. And he was talking about where you position your business. What I'm talking about is the challenge of what you do to position your community. It's really important because every community has a point of difference and it's how you position that point of difference and how you bring that together and we've heard that from Gary in what Tamora's done and they're a, a shining example 
of what they've done over there over a number of years to bring that community together and achieve economic success and increase population. A shining light. But there's another community or two communities and one in particular that I'd like to talk about in the Irana region that not that long ago, late 2000s, it was a community that was down and out. It was in despair. It was in the grip of the worst drought that we've seen in the last decade. Empty shops abundant in its main street. Services were driven at a rapid rate and they were really in despair. And that's the township of Ningen in the Shire of Ogun. And you drive through Ningen now and it is an economic hub for that little district. And the reason it is, and it has mining, and it always had mining. It's had it for the last 20 years. But what it showed was that while it had mining, that still wasn't its driver. What its driver was, was its agriculture sector. And because now there's a bit of an alignment and we've got some good weather, we've had some good weather conditions over the last three to five years, some better than others, of course, their mining activity is still going along and you drive up their main street, there is one vacant shop, not 20 vacant shops, and the main street is a buzz. Why is that so? Because the community came together, identified that there were some problems and they had to work on it. And they started working on it. So when, so they positioned themselves and when the time came and the stars started, started to align with the weather conditions, good agriculture seasons, good commodity prices in terms of agriculture, they were able to take advantage of it. The other town we talk about is the narrow mine training. Exactly the same. They did the two different things. Is, is they didn't have any um, agriculture, uh, any uh, mining activity taking place. It was purely on agriculture. They had the heart and soul ripped out of their community with the Murray Darling Basin Plan, the implementation of that, the loss of water. So, without going into that. That certainly was soul destroying at that point in time. But the community came together, they spoke to business, they got community together, and they understood what they had to do. They had to position themselves ready for the challenges ahead. And so when the stars aligned, they could make hay while the sun shines. And they've done that and they've done really well. And there's probably lots of other communities around the state that have done the same thing. There are some communities that haven't done it and haven't been able to um, achieve success um, because of, of other reasons and normally because they haven't come together with community and business. In most cases when I talk to those communities and I ask the questions, that's normally the problem. There's some communities out there now that are really doing that and we're starting to see that success and when if you look at within the Irana region, our population um, across the region as a whole is growing at about 1.1%. Uh, the state average is 1.5%. And when you consider in the 2000s, and particularly towards the end, population decline throughout the entire region was just over 1% was the decline. We knew we had to arrest the decline before we could start on the gain. Some communities have just arrested the loss so they haven't seen much gain. But in general across the region, you've been able to see some population increase and that's the stuff that becomes encouraging. And I guess, how do you do that? How do you fix that? Well, I, as, as I said, we need to consult with community and we certainly need to consult with business. And the responsibility of that, as I said, does it lie with local government or does it lie with community? I believe it lies with community community goes to local government, asks for the support and brings them on board. The other thing that we need to do and which is an impediment right across um, most regional areas, whether it's a small community or whether it's a large community or a, or a regional city, is the cost to do business. And Michael certainly touched on it today and it's something that I've often spoken about, and I've certainly spoken about it 
um, at a state level that the planning instrument that happens across the entire New South Wales is generic. And for the life of me, I can't understand why we have to have the same planning instrument that they need in a metropolitan city with a dense population, and Matthew's quoted the statistics on that density, where you come out into a regional area and you have to abide by exactly the same planning instrument. I think that uh, not only in some cases do we not have the expertise for the implement, implementation of those planning um, applications, but certainly the cost, and it's certainly an impediment. The only way that regional areas will grow is through the creation of small business in a lot of cases. And they are young, well not necessarily young, but they're entrepreneurial people that want to go into business. And when you start applying the planning instrument, it in a lot of cases just becomes prohibitive. The cost to do business is too expensive. Now the thing about that is, and it's all right to say if you're a big company to say that is the cost, so we have to allow for that. When you're starting out in small business, if you only just have the money to go into the business, you don't have necessarily the money that it takes, which is the cost to do that business. And the other thing is you can't borrow it. Banks will not lend it. It's not something you can put on your balance sheet. It's simply a raw cost. So if someone wants to open up a business and it's costing them $100,000, and then when they get their application out, there's some um, uh, charges applicable to that, and whether they're 10, 15, 20, 25,000, $30,000, whatever they happen to be, they have to have that cash. Now, if you're doing business for 100,000 and you go to the bank, you've got to have at least 35,000 or 40,000 in cash. You have to have some security for the other 60,000. So it gives you the 100,000. Then you need to find money to pay for those other on costs to do the business. And that's where the problem lies. So people just work it out and say, well, it's too expensive to do business, so I'm not gonna do business, and they end up doing something else. We lose them effectively from our community. They head off to the big smoke or somewhere else over the coast. They go out, I know of um, guys that have gone and done the FIFA, made a lot of money, come back, packed up, moved, gone somewhere else from a regional location, ended up in a, uh, uh, a city, metropolitan area, and gone into business and made good money. And said, geez, I should have done this years ago. But if they were able to do the business, with the, uh, create the business within their community, they would have stayed in their community, they would have created jobs. And that's what happened. And that's, if we work out what we can do to help fix up those challenges, in my mind, that's, a, that's a, an easy one for government. As Roger Fletcher said today, with the stroke of a pen, a discussion that he had in the stroke of a pen, that they changed some migration laws for backpackers that, that solved a skill shortage. And that's the other one I'd like to talk about is the potential around migration. We've seen what the new population was, 60,000 people that have moved to regional areas in the last 12 months. And I would suggest that a lot of that is off the back of the migration visas. And if you look at the opportunity that exists around that, it's extensive. Now we're bringing people, we're not talking about illegal immigrants, we're talking about legal immigrants that apply to come into Australia. They come out and they have the opportunity to come to regional areas and if we as communities and as regions, I, and the, this is the important thing, we need to identify where the skill gap is. And go to the ABS and have a look and they say these are the generic ones across the regional areas in Australia but we need to be a lot more clinical about that, we need to drill down and say what are the actual skills that we need in a particular town and we need to do the effort because if you can then replace, fill those skills with migrate, um, people immigrating into Australia, migrants, if we can do that, that has certainly helped going to drive the communities and there's lots of evidence of that taking place in rural and remote communities where doctors and dentists and chemists and other 
other services that we've been able to take advantage of, but I don't think we take full advantage of it. And I think that's another thing that go, and what it does, when they go into the community, they change the dynamic of the community because there's new blood coming into the community, they have a different outlook, they have a different ethic, and that changes within the community and helps the community to start to see things from a different perspective and it lifts the activity in the community. And I see that in numerous communities that I go to, particularly around the Arana region, I see that those activities um, and those, in those, those people that have migrated into those communities certainly make a difference. The other thing, quickly, because I know we haven't got a lot of time, um, that I think that we can fix some of these challenges that we face is using the NBN. Matthew's discussed that. And we talk about the NBN, but it's delivered in many ways. We were, that was explained to us this morning if we didn't understand that. So it's not about being in a regional city and having the NBN rolled out. There's lots of other ways that the, they're going to deliver the NBN and the opportunities around that. I've spoken about planning and the approval process and the planning reforms where I think that we need to take to government. We need to discuss it. I know there's a will in there. It certainly will, but we need to. It's all right for the people that live in Paddington and Surrey Hills and the voters that come and go, but they're influencing what happens to us out in regional areas. Government policy, both federally and state, are, are aligned really, really well at the moment for the growth of regional areas and the challenges we face. Is it enough? No, I don't think so. But it's certainly a start for us as communities to start taking advantage of that, showing the worth of it. Once we show the worth of it, we can then start the discussion with government in relation to what they can do and what they can do better. Thank you.